just so everybody knows, the webinar is being recorded um, and you're being muted, but you can unmute yourself or type in the chat box with any questions um, or comments you have at the end of the presentation. Um, so my name is Ashley Amos and I'm one of the planning coordinators with the West Virginia Department of Ag. Um, I'm located in Nicholas County and I cover the southeastern part of the state. Um, so I just want to take a couple minutes to go over our um, business development slides and then we will hear from Ashley Jackson with uh, Gregson Gardens and um, and then we'll wrap it up with some some questions at the end. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm one of the planning coordinators around the state. Um, we're here to help you with um, selling or developing your business plans or um, marketing. We do we help with product production plans or help you get permits, things like that. Um, so we have four of us around the state and um, the areas that aren't highlighted, we we kind of split up those and, and take those calls as well. Um, one of the other program that's um, in the business development division is our West Virginia Grown Marketing Program. Um, it's free for growers and producers around the state. And so as a member, you can use that logo for branding on um, on your products and displays um, and things like, you know, meat, produce, baked goods. We have some candle people. Um, so and some other bonuses include that your info can be on our website and in the market bulletin um, and be featured on some some videos on our Facebook. Another program that's housed in our business development division is the Veterans and Heroes Ag program. Um, so this supports veterans and, um, and heroes getting into ag through education, scholarships, mentorship opportunities, um, technical and business development support, and navigating available resources. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and let Ashley take this over. Let me stop sharing my screen. OK, you should be able to share yours now. OK, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. OK. Please. OK, good evening. My name is Ashley Jackson. I'm with Graxton Gardens and Graxton Gardens is a backyard garden. It's a hobby garden. It is not a market garden. I do not sell. And so it is basically a hobby garden. And a little bit about myself is I started saving seeds uh, nearly uh, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And um, I got my start in growing herbs and flowers, just a, kind of in a landscaping hobby. Um, and just kind of migrated into vegetable gardening as I got older. Why should you save seed? So reasons for sh saving seed would be uh, genetic diversity, self-reliance, some cost savings, variety adaptation, heirlooms, attracting pollinators. Genetic diversity. More than 90% of the world's seed diversity has vanished in the last century. That's an astonishing number. I read somewhere where there was cabbages, um, 800 and some varieties of cabbage at the turn of the century. And in, in the early 80s, that number had reduced to less than 100. So if you can imagine that drastic of a decline or loss of a variety of seed or, or a variety in such a short time, with just one variety, can you imagine all the seeds and varieties we've lost? One of the major factors of that is the industrialization of agriculture and the consolidation of seed companies. This is during the um, great during the Second War. Um, a lot of uh, agriculture became industrialized, mechanized, and the seed companies began become consolidated. And in the nature of the beast, you know, the seed companies are in it for a profit. So. 
hybridization of seeds are more profitable than the open pollinateds, the old heirloom types, and that's the and most of the open pollinateds kind of just fell away over the years. There's substantial data that shows the higher yields and more crop uniformity as a trade-off for the lower nutrient dense crop. And um, everybody knows that uh, it's a common thing that most of your heirlooms are have a better flavor, but generally don't have the yield of a of an air hybrid in some cases. Another reason for saving seed is self-reliance. This current pandemic that we've gone through in the few, last few years has woken many new individuals to the importance of seed security. And I know a lot of people that's gotten into garden in the last two years and they've just discovered how hard it is to get seeds now. So seed saving can be an important life skill. Another reason is most reasons most people don't think of as cost savings. It's not in backyard gardening like mine and most majority of our, um, you know, normal size smaller gardeners cost savings is probably not a huge um huge factor in order decision making on saving seeds but again I, like when i was starting the cost savings wasn't important because i was worried about landscaping like flower beds things like that and you know when you go to box stores to buy um flowers and plants and perennials they're expensive i mean those plants are five or six dollars a piece and you buy 20 30 of them you got hundreds of dollars involved I actually discovered that you could save seed off some perennials and make a hundred plants off seeds. And that was a breakthrough for me. That's what got my interest sparked with seed saving back in the late nineties. You can save excess seeds for trading and bartering for seeds you don't have. And there's a lot of uh, seed saving clubs and online forums that they trade and their people mail seeds back. That's how I started saving seeds. And back before the internet, I, I did um, mailing exchange for seeds. Um, from actually some probably illegal <laughs> from across it was some international seed trading going on with um people from Helsinki Finland back back before the internet now there's laws in place to prevent that which is a good thing another reason you should have a to save seeds is for ad, adaptation to your region when you save seeds from the best performing plants grown on your land and with your climate and conditions you can gradually develop varieties that are better adapted to your soil climate and growing practices. Uh, an example of that is um, there's a reputable seed company in Maine that sells seeds and a lot of um, gardeners buy their seeds from Maine, this, this kind of garden seed company. However, here in West Virginia, where we're located, um, the seeds that we may be buying from Maine that are grown in Maine gardens may not be best adapted here. I mean, they may grow here, but not the same, the, the daylight length and in Maine, in the dead of summer, is 15 to 16 hours. Most people don't realize that uh, the the daylight at 4:30, 5 o'clock in the morning, it's daylight in northern Maine, and that's a substantial amount of different daylight hours. And the climate it rarely gets above 80 degrees. So you take that in factor and start growing something that was grown in Maine for 10 years and try to grow that in your soil and your climate and temperature that's 90 some degrees, 100 percent humidity and different daylight hours it can be a can be a shock to the variety and de depending on the variety but as you save your seed and adapt over time it starts to become more acclimated to your region and becomes a more stronger vigorous uh, uh, variety and another one is fair family heirlooms most people will keep seeds because they were passed down from heritage and that's uh some of the seeds i have are were passed down from my, my grandfather uh, some of them we don't even know the variety name um, but that's um, another reason that most people will save seeds. The heritage breeds are disappearing with seed companies merging and turning their focus primarily on the more profitable hybrid and GMO seeds, as I mentioned before. Another reason to save seeds is attracting pollinators. Allowing plants to grow to their full maturity provides flowers to pollinators. Flowers bring beneficial predators to your garden to help battle common pests. This year in particular in my garden, I actually um, have a lot of onions that we put out for seed and they produced a lot of flowers and we had a, a plethora of many wild um, bees and predatory wasps come into our carrot flowers or uh, mustard flowers. The, so the flowers that um, are kind of uh, some, kind of secondary uh, to the seeds we were sown for, to, to I'm sorry, the plants we have grown for, for harvesting seeds attracted a lot of beneficial insects that actually predated on our on the pests we had we had asparagus beetles this year 
And then uh, instead of having to worry about spraying, even spraying a, an organic spray, sometimes I, we have to resort to even an organic sp spray for spraying the asparagus beetle. And I learned this year that the predatory wasp took care of them for me without even having to spray. It was, a, it was actually a nice, uh, nice um, change for me this year. So if we're going to save seeds, we need to understand what the difference is of what the plants, um, their, their variety, no, well, not their variety, I'm sorry, the, um, the life cycle of the plants. There's, um, there's annual plants, there's perennial plants, and there's biennial plants. And it's important we know the difference between these three. Annual plants grow, produce flowers, set seed, and do not regrow from the parent roots the following year. They're usually the showiest of the flowers and the longest flowering plants. They they potentially can self-sow and return next season from the seeds that were sown. And the picture you see is a picture of the dill that's in full flower. Dill is an annual that will uh, flower the first season and drop its seeds and can just actually become a weed in some applications. Some of your gardens can be a weed if you have really fertile soil, and uh, which is a good thing for me. I like it that way, but so they can come back. Perennial plants live multiple seasons from the roots. Um, you must consider the growing zone of the plants. What may be a perennial, perennial in your zone or another zone may be an annual in a different zone. For example, tomatoes could be, or definitely an annual in our area, but in some parts of uh, Central America, tomatoes are a perennial. They continue to grow. Asparagus is a, another example of a perennial that can grow for multiple seasons. Annual plants are kind of a, in their own class. They're, um, they're plants that grow for two seasons. Biennials grow their foliage the first year and then produce the flower or the root, the seed the second year. They can grow their, the foliage or the root system that you would harvest the first year. And if by leaving the carrots in the ground, the, the second season they will flower and produce seed. That's a, an example of a, a biennial is a carrot, um, parsnips, a caraway seed is a, is a biennial plant from a plant beyond biennial plant. So open pollinated varieties. Open pollinated varieties are the are usually the target varieties that we we're going to sort of save our seeds from because open pollinated variety open pollinated varieties, if properly isolated from other varieties in the same plant species, will produce seed that is genetically true to type. This means that the seed will result in a plant that's very similar to the parent. Heirloom varieties are generally open pollinated. This picture to the right here is uh, of heirloom field pumpkins that has been in grown that's been grown in Leon, West Virginia, for over 100 and some years in my my sister in law's family. What makes an heirloom an heirloom? The term heirloom has increased in popularity in the recent years, but what exactly does it mean? Heirloom describes a seed's heritage specifically a documented heritage heritage of being passed down from generation to generation within a family or community. An heirloom variety of vegetable, fruit, or flower must be open pollinated or pollinated by insects, bird, winds, or other natural means, and breed true or retain its original traits from one generation to the next. While some organizations label seeds as heirloom according to dates, for example, a variety that dates back more than five decades, Seed Savers Exchange identifies heirlooms by verifying and documenting the generational history of preserving and passing on the seed, emphasizing the seeds tied to a specific group of people. Varieties introduced to the U.S. seed trade before 1950, meanwhile, are labeled at, as historic at Seed Savers Exchange. Though often also, also organic, heirloom seeds do not have to be. In many cases, heirloom plants do meet the guidelines of the USDA's National Organic Program because they are typically grown on small by small-scale gardeners who have adopted organic fam farming practices. Heirloom seeds constitute, I'm sorry, constitute, constitute a critical part of the nas nation's agricultural heritage and help ensure genetic diversity of plant species. Founded in 1975, the Seed Savers Exchange helped pioneer the heirloom seed movement, and, and it continues its works to preserve circulate and sell rare and heirloom seeds to this day. Hybrid varieties. Hybrid varieties are um, kind of gets a bad rep in the um, the seed saving uh, realm of seed savers. So hybrid varieties are, are, are seeds 
that are from two different um, plants then and the, the seeds that you save from a hybrid may not be true if you you can sow the seeds they may grow they may sprout they may produce what you're wanting but may not have the exact same effect for example if you're growing a, a sweet cantaloupe and it's a hybrid you may plant this cantaloupe seed and it may produce cantaloupe plant leaves grow vines grow fruit but when you taste a fruit it may be bitter or maybe terrible it may look good but may not be the same so that's sometimes you can get that from a hybrid sometimes you may have a sterile seed it may not produce any fruit whatsoever um, but hybrid varieties are created by crossing two different varieties of the same plant crossing involves taking the pollen from the male flower of one plant and transferring it to the female flowers parts of a different plant hybrid seeds are listed as f1 types as opposed to open pollinated types open pollinated seeds result from a simple sharing of pollen between two like parents plant breeders cross varieties and record their results over and over until a formula emerges that produces consistently excellent results this process can take years it is an attempt to tease out the best genetic traits of both parent plants and combine them in a hybrid seed and this is what you typically see in a, in a and a seed saving, I'm sorry, a seed company that sells seeds that are hybrids for market gardeners because they have more plant vigor, more ad adapt to, to fight off uh, pathogens and funguses and diseases. Um, they may produce a less tastier fruit in some cases, but a more prolific, more abundant fruit. Some cases they may be a sweeter fruit, but maybe it's not as vigor. So depending on what your what type of high variety we're looking at it can be very circumstantial but as in this illustration you see uh, sweet corn and this is a uh, one of the com most common things we see a lot of hybrids of in today's community gardens and backyard gardens is a uh, the pollen is taken from one tassel and the other female is pollinated from the flower of the other male parent and that's how we uh, the seed companies are able to hybridize the the seed and and over many, many generations of, of doing this, they developed a, a stable seed. It's not, a, it's marketable. Here's an example of a, a seed company. Actually, this is the seed company in Maine. Johnny C Selected Seeds, a very reputable company. Uh, I buy seeds from there. They're, they're, a, they're a hybrid seed. This, this seed company sells a lot of hybrid seeds. And how you can tell is by looking on the package, I have it, um, highlighted and brought over so you can see it on the screen. It's this case, it's, it shows it in two locations. It says hybrid and also has F1. Some seed packets may not say hybrid. Some seed packets may be um, very under, hard to under, under, understand what is hybrid and what's not. So how to identify that is looking at the seed pack and, and, and identifying the F1 or the typical word of hybrid. There's two categories of seeds that we uh, classify them in. This is for basically harvesting uh, dry seed and wet seed. Dry seed are your um, seeds that are harvested dry, most just as it explains. Beans, uh, carrots, lettuce, brassicas, which are your mustards, cabbages, broccolis, Brussels sprouts, um, turnips, radishes, those all fall in the brassica family. Grains such as wheat, r barley rice, uh, must mustards can be considered as grains, but peppers, those are all considered a dry seed. A wet seed would be considered uh, cucumbers, melons, like cantaloupe, musk melons, strawberries, eggplants, squash, winter and summer squash, tomatoes. Those are all wet seeds. Here's an example of a, of a dry seed. This is actually a, a red leaf lettuce that I grew in my garden last year. I grow a lot of leaf lettuces in my garden and um, when I find one I really like, a new variety, I, I want to save the seed. And this is one that uh, kind of measured up for me last year. It's called Red Leaf Lettuce Merlot. Um, I got this from a seed company. It's open pollinated seed. As you can see in the left screen, that's a really beautiful deep purple lettuce. And it's my, one of my favorites now. So as summer progresses, um, this picture on the right is a picture of the lettuce and which we call bolting. This it's actually when this this the plant is coming to its end of the the growth of the leaves and begins to want to flower, wants to go through its life cycle. It's lettuces are annuals. So it's wanting to flower and produce seed. This picture on the right is probably late July, 
yeah, late July last year, early August. On the left, this is a uh, probably uh, early, middle August. It's um fifty percent flowering. You can see on the left, there's flowers opening. They're starting to. It's what we call feathering. It's when the buds are starting to open and feather with lettuce. You know, it's one of those seeds that you don't want to let it dry on the plant because um, when it starts to dry, it can actually start to open up and crack the seed pods, and winds can blow away all your seed <laughs> that you're trying to harvest. So it's a it's a fairly easy. Um, plant to harvest seed from it's um it's actually it's hard not to make it let it go to flower because it's trying to do its thing on the right here's actually after it was harvested you can see the seed has been cleaned and put in a baggie i put a piece of newspaper in the baggie to act as a desiccant that pulls any moisture out of the seed that may be left behind keeping your seed dry You'll notice on my seed packets, I, I write down the uh, source of my seed when I bought the seed. So I told you I bought that seed last year and I grew it last year and I, I uh, decided I really like the seed. So this year I've planted some with the intention of saving some plants to uh, grow the seed from and we harvested it just this last month and saved the seed. And we'll start to uh, grow that seasonally every year so we can develop our um, own seed from our, our area. Another um, example of dry seeds. These are some pictures from my previous harvest from years ago. Um, jalapenos on the left, you'll notice. Um, notice the picture's got two different colored fruit, and that's um, something I want to talk about um, with these peppers. When you want to harvest peppers, um, well, any fruit for that matter, um, if you're going to harvest peppers, when you want the fruit to be at its highest viability, that is when the seed is at its if you're going to save seed, you want something that's going to be very viable, something that's going to germinate. Your germination rate depends on how, when you select your fruit. And on the left, you see the jalapenos are red. And on the right, you see the jalapenos are green. I harvested these jalapenos at the same time. And I don't throw away the seeds from the green jalapenos because they still will germinate. But I do separate. So I separate. When I when I package these seeds, I package them as jalapeno seeds, red jalapenos seeds green so i know that one may have a higher germination rate and i'll get to that in a minute about the germination test on the right i have a white iroquois corn this is kind of a, um, a hard to find heritage corn that i've found from it's up in the new england states it's a dent corn it makes very good cornmeal uh, flour tortillas you know, my family makes flour tortillas from this and you can make grits it's a very good it's a make um trying to think of the name oh hominy we make hominy from this corn and it's called nixtamalization here's some examples of wet fruits tomatoes everybody wants to save tomato seeds that's probably the most common question most people talk about is saving tomatoes saving seeds from tomatoes and you can see how ripe and beautiful red dark red this tomato is on the left that's when you want to harvest the seeds from these tomatoes you don't want a tomato that's really firm. I mean, you can save seeds from a, a firm tomato and they will germinate, but it's just like the jalapenos. If you select a tomato that's really dark red, almost overly ripe, that's when you want to harvest the seeds. On the right, you have a cucumber. This is a straight eight and those are the same variety as you see. Um, the one on the bottom is actually the most ideal in my family to harvest for um, fixing. But uh, as you can see right above that, that Cucumber is really past due and it's overly ripe. Probably not palatable, probably not the best for the dinner table, but that is the um, type of cucumber you want for seed saving. If you was to harvest a seed out of the cucumber on the bottom, you probably would get zero germination from those seeds. The one on the top is um, actually not completely ripe. You, you actually really want them when they're almost completely yellow. This uh, cucumber actually got away from me, didn't even know it was there. So when we harvested it, it's like, I ah, will save it for seed, but you get the point. So cleaning the seed. On the left, you, you have an example of cleaning dry seed. On the right, this is an example that most people don't think of as a method of cleaning seed. It's a, actually a, a strainer or a food meal that you process tomatoes or other fruits with. This is what I used to process tomato seeds with. Um, a lot of information out there on um, processing tomatoes for um, seed saving. And the most common that you see is, is squeezing the 
the seeds out with the pulp and the, the, the juice and you'll have the gelatin substance that comes out with the tomatoes and you ferment it for several days. And that is ideally the, the, the most popular and probably the best tried and true method, but you don't have to. I've saved many, many, many seeds from tomatoes with vo not even just voiding that whole, whole um, process. I've actually just squeezed seeds into the strainer you see on the right and just used the sprayer from your kitchen sink and filter them out, get the gelatin base separated from it and just dry them on a paper towel and they will germinate just fine. Not saying that you shouldn't ferment them because if you do ferment the seeds, you can, um, it, your seeds can have a strong immune system because of the, um, the fermentation process can break down some other, su the substance, the gelatin base that can carry over some harmful pathogens. So it's, it's your choice. It's not you have to do it, but it's probably preferable that you do for the fermentation to the tomatoes. On the left, this is these are little boxes. This is a, actually not my picture. Um, this is a, a very common thing people build. I've built my own out of just screens of different size mesh, and, and depending on what you're going to screen, you use the appropriate size mesh. Some people use um, craft wire, like you would use in a chicken coop lot for separating beans or and larger seeds and for smaller seeds you use a smaller seed you get the idea with that so how are you cleaning the seed there's many methods and old world terminology for this that one of those terms is called threshing threshing is a very old term it's a very old process medieval biblical times threshing is the process of removing the seeds from the outer portion known as the chaff Usually for more difficult to remove seeds, wheat is uh, one that comes to mind. When we, we actually grow wheat on our garden in a small scale, and wheat is one of those that you kind of need to separate them by either. You can see in the picture this woman has a wiffle ball bat, and <laughs> that's a very good tool. She's actually beating the, the wheat and separating her bar alfalfa, I believe she's got maybe. The seed pods are crushed or rubbed depending on the type of seed. Uh, many many different ways of threshing can be used with um, pounding it in old days they would thresh it on the ground like grabbing a bundle of wheat and just uh, threshing it on the ground they uh, step on it they run over it um, some cases um, and what we do in our house is we take brown paper bags and we, like mustard seeds we take the mustard seed pods which look like little miniature green beans when they're dry you um just fill the green uh, brown bag full and just take your hand and just start rubbing them together. And, and that's actually a form of threshing. It's just separating the seed from the, the outer hull. Another method is called winnowing. This is um, winnowing is a process of separating the seeds from the outer portion known as the chaff. The, the seed is in the hull is difference in weight or shape respond different to the effects of gravity with the gentle breeze. So you're using the wind or another source of uh, moving air to make the, the lighter portions of seeds separate from the, the heavier, harder portion. Um, a method that I use at home is um, a cookie sheet. We can take seeds and um, after we've threshed the seed, maybe have to thresh them and then winnow it. So we thresh the seed in a, in a bucket and pour it onto a large cookie sheet. Put it on an incline and kind of just shake the trays gently like sort of like painting for gold and uh, the hard round seeds usually fall fast and the, the lightweight seeds fall behind and it's a good way to filter out the majority of the larger stuff and you may have to go back and then use this winnowing process you see on the screen with the um, a fan of some sort or, or you can use the wind there's been times i've used the wind for some types of seeds another <laughs> Example of using winnowing that's kind of very unconventional is that when my children were small, my children are grown now, but when my children were small, they had a little playground in the backyard with the uh, the slicky slide, and it was a plastic slicky slide, it was a playground. And um, the slicky slide, and if any of you know, have you ever been around plastic slicky slides or anything like that, you 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 rub your arm or body across it, you have a static charge. So that works out really good for seed separating. I, I used to take all my mustard seeds and brassicas of it. Must, uh, brassicas uh, like cabbages, uh, mustards, lettuces, things like that. And we would um, separate the seed in the brown paper bag, like I said, then pour it on the slide and just give it a little tiny vibration pounds on the top of the slide. And all the heavy seed would go down the slide into a tote and the rest of the seed would stick to the slide. It's a very, very good way. It works really well for some seeds. So if you have a slicky slide around, that's a 
really nice tool. Another uh, method of winnowing using modern technology, a, a fan of some sort. You can see in, on the left here this uh, box fan and just taking the tote and just um, pouring the, the seed out of the tote really gently in front of a fan blowing. The heavier seed will fall into tote in the foreground and the seed will separate. The lighter portions will, will go outside of the box and several, several um, times you have to do this before you get the seed pretty clean, but it works really well. So talking about containers for seeds, um, there's um, many, many different ways that people save seeds and, and how they put them, how they store them. I mean, for years, we've seen many different ways. And the consensus in the seed saving community is that mylar, mylar resealable bags are the choice for of majority seed savers. Um, they seem to be the, the best across the board. Um, if you do have a seeds you save and you see these little silica gel packets those are excellent um little things to throw in your seed packs whatever you use uh, pill bottles envelopes ziploc bags i don't care what you use if you use if you have these these are great to put in the seeds with them they pull off moisture i use newspaper in these so there are many ways people have stored seeds over the years um, pill bottles glass jars envelopes mailers bubble wrap plastic baggies get the point many different things and some things you just um for a backyard gardener like myself and the majority of people just don't have the space to put everything in and in, in jars i mean if you have extensive seed categories uh, collection if you use jars you'd have to have a, a whole room dedicated and I, and I don't have that most people don't have that so you kind of select what seeds are the most important to you um what are the what are the easiest to get a hold of? What are common? What are rare? What, you know, the size of the seed? And, and that kind of dictates what you want to put them in. You see on the left here, I have I have seeds that are in envelopes. Um, and um, actually, ironically, you can see in this picture on the left, the jalapeno seeds. This is uh, the two seed packets. You can see um, jalapeno seeds, uh, original source, Ohio heirloom seeds. I put the, the, the name of where the seeds came from when I obtained them. But down here, you probably can't see it on the screen, but there's the germination percentage. I test these every Christmas time. It's the perfect time. It's when everything kind of slows down in gardening. Um, you're home for the holidays and don't have anything to do. So I just, I take that time of year to uh, take some seeds and and I will sow a few of them. You can, you're not worried about harvesting or planting these out in the garden. So you can sow a whole a whole, bot, a whole lot of different seeds in one seed tray. You can actually do it in a Ziploc plastic bag or a, or a jar with a little wet paper towel just to do a germination test. And what you do is you take 10, 20 seeds, depending on the seed size and how many you have, and just you plant 20 seeds and, and you get 19 of them. You got 95% germination and you write that on the bag. So and if you keep up, up with that every year in your seed packet, you will know if your seed is getting close to being bad or if it's still good because some seeds some tomato seeds i have are 10 years old and they still get produced 90 percent germination even against the odds of what most will tell you some seeds will not keep very long some will keep longer but the germination test will is a good test to do you can see on this seed packet i actually did a, a 90 percent germination test on december the 7th of 2017 and i got 90 percent germination on april 12th of 2020 and interesting is that the seed packet that was the green seed, you can see it was 75%, 75% germination rate the first season versus 90%. That's an example of why I would always harvest the, the ripe fruits versus a not complete ripe fruit. So I have seed in envelopes and I put them in uh, plastic storage containers and to try to keep as much moisture off them as possible. Um, probably no, not the most ideal seed storage, but it's done. Here's some uh, plastic uh, containers that I keep larger seed in, the, something that um, it's a little harder to keep in paper bags. So these are some heritage corn and beans that I have that I keep in uh, plastic containers. Oh, I forgot I did this. So yeah, it's already blown up here for you. So you can see there's the, um, the green jalapeno seed versus the red jalapeno seed. And you can see the germination rate difference. So it's important that what you put on the seed packet when you store them is to put the variety name, um, the date you harvest it. And it's good for me. I, I like to have the source of where I got the seed from. 
sometimes if I have a trade, I'll I'll put the um, person's name I traded from. Then I, I like to put the germination rates on them as I, I do them um, over the years. And you can go back and look and see, oh, this seed's 10 years old. Well, but it was, you know, so much germination last year. It's still good. If you get to seeds that don't have very good germination, you pitch them or do what you need to do. So where to store your seeds? On the right, you can see um, this is a, an old cupboard a cabinet I have in a, in a spare room. It's it's a room, it's a, in my opinion, the coldest room in the house that stays stable pretty much year round. It doesn't have a lot of fluctuation in temperature. So that's where I keep a lot of seeds that are, you know, not real, what I would call high, high profile uh, heirloom seeds that I would, if I lost or I wouldn't be worried. An area that is cool, dark and dry is the um, ideal uh, a dark bedroom closet that's another place dry basement somewhere it's just stable in temperature a low fluctuation that's important um keep a list of your seeds I and mean, that's one of the things that really really um boggles me is um, a lot of people save seeds but they don't know what they have and you um, get you get in a conversation about trading seeds sometimes and it's like oh well, i gotta get my seeds together so it's important if you have the time to do the seed saving to make a list it don't have to be on a computer it can be on a ledger paper and be on a notebook any way you would like i i actually do mine in a spreadsheet and i have it digitally accessible so where i do seed trades online and and i can share that with people and keep it updated but it don't have to be fancy it can be simple i start off on a notebook So storing seeds in a freezer it probably scares a lot of people. It did me years ago when I first heard of this. So if you have some seeds that are really um, high value to you and you don't want to lose them and you want to keep them for a long storage, um, I, I prefer the glass jars. Glass jars with the lid sealed them and you want to make sure they're at the right um, moisture content. You want them to be dry. You don't want to put wet seed in a freezer. In this picture here, I've got some uh, um, Heritage corn, um, some heritage wheats that uh, that's not easily to get, so I actually put it in my freezer and keep it there. And interesting, you see that the uh, glass jar in the top right looks like a jug. That's actually uh, something my daughter drinks a lot is apple juice, and they come from the dollar store. And they have a little uh, resealable lid on. They're excellent for putting seeds in, and they're free. Otherwise, it's been trashed. But um, the freezer is a good place to keep some seeds. Um, onion seeds is one of the probably the most popular for me because onion seeds, if you are keeping onion seeds, the viability, the life of onion seeds is usually a year at the most if you do not put them in a freezer. Even in a freezer, they they rarely sell them last more than two to three years. They um, lose viability shelf life very quickly. Speaking of shelf life, the viability of seeds, um, I've listed a few. Um, I'm going to go through them all. I don't know how hard it is for you to see on your screens because it's probably small text, but um, you see here onions. It's uh, one year, one year of the, I'm sorry, I have to go back. One year for the onion seeds viability is what the recommendation is from a large consensus of seed companies out there. Um, tomatoes, four years. I, I've had tomato seeds go well over 10 years before. I mean, it's not common, but they do. They last a long time if you keep them in the proper storage. I keep hitting the wrong button. Sorry. Um, so there's a chart. And um, if you're interested, in, there's it's high mowing seeds. You can download these charts for all these seeds um, that you're looking to store or what kind of seeds you are interested in and how long they lie, uh, the life of the seed. There's a lot of good resources and I'll post them at the end of this, uh, this uh, report. I'm sorry, this presentation. Some excellent resources that you can uh, find online for um, save seed saving. To, I mean, seed saving, depending on what you're talking about, can be totally different from each crop. So instead of going through all of these crops, and I'm not the expert, I'm experienced, but not the expert. These are the experts. The seed savers online have many, many, many different uh, resources of seed saving from many different places. So I highly recommend if you're interested in saving a seed, look these companies up and look at look at what they have to offer there's a some um, what you would find at seed savers exchange seed savers exchange is a wonderful resource so if you're looking for carrots for example you can see i've got carrots highlighted if you clicked on carrots you would see it would give you the growing information the seed saving um, storage and all all the pertinent information that you need 
here's an example of what you would find on this page. It would give you the how to save the carrots or a life cycle and see it tells you it's a biannual. It's recommended isolation distance um, and there's and that can get really technical if you're in there's terms glossary terms and you know jargon the terminology of seed saving all of that is in this in these um sites that you can learn all these um terms if you're not familiar with them but um don't be scared about it just get out and save your seeds and it's the best advice i could say is just save them don't worry about all the technical terms see so it gives you the cleaning processing the storage and viability harvesting all the information you need. And these are some of those resources I would, I would highly recommend. Seed Savers Exchange is a is a wonderful one. High Mowing Seeds, a, a seeds company that sells seeds, and they also advocate saving their seeds. They're not not just for profit. They're 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 in the industry for saving for the for everyone to save their seeds. Seed Sovereignty is another excellent resource too. But have any questions for me? This was great information. I just wanted to point out there's a lot actually that I didn't know and um, even like that Seed Savers website. But I did just have like a question about where you sold. Um, you said you sold your like you trade seeds online. Um, where so where do you like where do you go for that or how do you how do you do that? Well, there's many places um, for starters. Let's say um, Facebook. Everybody knows Facebook. I don't. So if you're on Facebook, you can go to groups, and there's many, many places that are seed forums, and and there's a lot of them out there that are kind of like yes, dear, what clear from. There's you can look at their activity. If you look at a seed savers group on Facebook, you'll find that okay, they have like 50 some posts per day. That's usually the ones you want to join. If you look at one that has 30 um, people in it, and there's not but one post a month, it's probably not so active and not going to get very much information out of. Um, that's just generally speaking, but there's a, um, there's a there seed. Are like West Virginia specific or like. Yeah, there's actually, I, we actually have a Wayne County state saving in here okay. on our county. And there's, there's a West Virginia one. Um, I can get those and put links into this at the end, if you would like in the, in the comment section. Yeah, that, that would be nice. We can do that. Um, also, if you look up, um, I'm not like I said I'm not in it for profit. I don't grow for sale, but I have a Facebook page. It's Gregs Gardens. You can go there and find me and message me and and I'll be feel great, glad to help up in any way. I can answer any questions, lead you to where you might find that information, any kind of resources. Yeah, let's um, let's put that in the chat box too. Sure. I'll make a note of that. Does anybody else? Um, sorry, I just took over. Anybody have other questions? Yeah, I have one, actually. Um, actually, my question, going back to pollinators, do do you feel that heritage seeds tend to attract pollinators more than than other seeds, the hybrid or or any other type of seed? Um, That's a good question. I I don't know that there's a difference because um, Actually, the majority of my garden personally is heirlooms, so I, I don't really have a a good uh, comparison. Yeah, you don't have anything to compare it against. Yeah, so. I mean, I'm majority. I'm I, I'm not a I'm not a fan of hybrids because there's nothing nothing wrong with hybrids. I just prefer to save my seed, and I, that's just a it's not just a necessity. It's just more of a hobby. I prefer to save my seeds and regrow them. There's a couple exceptions like sweet corn and cantaloupes. I have yet to find an open pollinator that works for me in my area. Um, you'll find a lot of open pollinated cantaloupes out there on many seed catalogs, but I think maybe in a different climate, different place, they work great. But I have not found one for West Virginia that's open pollinated that works well. Not saying there's not, I just haven't found them. So gotcha. I use hybrids for that for, for just a few things. So the majority of the plants in my garden are open pollinated, and and, and that kind of just kind of makes that question hard for me to answer. I understand, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. And one one last one. Um, we've had <clears throat> we've had quite the time trying to source to the craft beverage industry in West Virginia. We've had some success, uh, a lot of failures, and these types of groups and this type of mindset on seed saving seems like it may match for small bat 
small batch craft beverage very nicely. Are you, you speaking about like, hops? Say it again. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, are you speaking of hops? Hops, barley, wheat. Yeah. Okay. Can you repeat the question about the what is the well, question? I, my question is: Do you feel like that there is a an established network of folks doing seed saving in West Virginia, growing those types of crops that so so may be useful for craft beverage industry? I don't know of any, and that's because that's more typically your grains, and we live in a region that's not very popular to grains now maybe in the the ohio valley region like mason county that's a probably i would in my opinion the probably most populous of grains in the state Uh, maybe up in the panhandle where and around maryland region there's some grain growers Um, i grow grain on a family scale you know for it's more of a hobby to to make enough to make four loaves of bread for the year so it's not a large scale at all but um Okay. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting question that could be um, researched a little and see if we could probably put a network of people together to do that. Because I, I know there's a there's a there's a huge demand for that in the state. There certainly is, and in this this type of mindset of seed saving, I I feel just as you as you continued your presentation, it just seemed like it may be a very nice fit and and a possible answer to some of the craft beverage uh, questions that we've been trying to conquer for years now. So that's um, very useful. Thank you, Ashley. You're welcome. Okay, does does anybody else um, have any other questions? And there was a, a comment, I don't know, Ashley, if you can see the chat, but um, there was a comment about the Facebook group name, so I put your your Facebook page name in there and then said that um, you could post those links in the chat box for her. Sure. So. Okay. I will do that. Yeah, is there any other questions? If not, we can wrap this up. Um, Ashley, thank you so much. This, Like I said, this was really useful for me too as well. I learned a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Um, and one last thing, I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have um, our next homestead studying is the 28th and it's going to be on aquaponics. So Tuesday at six on the 28th.